Like most humans, I'm a contradiction. I'm a creature of habit, yet I chose a job in which every single day is different, unpredictable, and sometimes relentless. And that is because I'm also easily bored. Um, I had ADHD before everyone on the planet had ADHD. This photo is shocking because I stood still to pose for it. Um, I'd be up at 5 a.m. with energy for days, and to this day, my mom would like me to be more thankful that she didn't put me on Ritalin like the doctor offered. I was a really tough kid. I was. I was really inquisitive, and I never stopped talking, and I always wanted to understand the why of everything. So I was asked to come here today and talk about change, and there was something hilarious about it because I hate it. But here's another truth. I've made so many changes in my life, and I know that all of you have too, and some of those are by choice, and many of them aren't. I do go kicking and screaming, and like a toddler having a tantrum, after I get through the change, I'm like, hmm, that was pretty good. I think I'm glad I did that, right? After you make it through. So handling change, here we go. H.P. Lovecraft, poor fellow, interesting name. <laughs> He was an American writer who died in 1937 in poverty, and he wrote works of horror fiction, and he's now regarded as one of the most significant 20th century authors in his genre. And I don't read horror fiction, but I do love this quote from him. The oldest and strongest emotion of mankind is fear, and the oldest and strongest kind of fear is fear of the unknown. Now, he wrote this sentence almost 100 years ago. Maybe he was talking about when you go to see what that noise is in the basement or you open the door and see what's behind it. But we confront the unknown in ways big and small every single day. We don't know what the weather will be like, how people will treat us, what the traffic's going to be like on the highway, our kids going to throw up at school and we have to go get them. At work, we love to complain. We do. About each other, about our bosses, about what needs to change, about how things would be better if only we were the boss or so-and-so was in charge. Yet when things actually change, we pretty much freak out. And it's that whole devil you know syndrome. Well, yeah, but at least I know what to expect with this or him or her. And that's because most human beings have a resistance to change. It scares us for a lot of reasons. Fear of failure, rejection, criticism, fear of the unknown, and even fear of success. This is one of my favorite books. I don't like self-help books. I don't read self-help books. I wouldn't call this a self-help book. I'd call it a kick in the head. It's called The War of Art. And the entire book is about the role that resistance plays in our lives. Stephen Pressfield wrote it back in 2002 and it became a big cult hit. And on page 16 of The War of Art, it says this. Resistance has no strength of its own. Every ounce of juice that possesses comes from us. <coughs> we feed it with power by our fear of it master that fear, and we conquer resistance. So that force that makes you swallow your urge to pursue your dream is called resistance, and it affects every single one of us in this room. It is this nagging, negative, horrible little voice in your head, and we all have that voice, that tells you you're a fraud, that you're not good enough, one day they're gonna be on to you and throw you out the door. It's the voice that tells you not to try anything new because you'll fail, or maybe, better yet, you know, maybe you'll try something new, but you'll do that tomorrow. How many of you in this room have ever put off doing something? Show of hands. Yeah, right. If you didn't raise your hand, I wouldn't believe you. Well, I love this part. Procrastination is the most common manifestation of resistance because it's the easiest to rationalize. We don't tell ourselves, I'm never going to write my symphony. Instead, we say, I'm going to write my symphony. I'm just going to start tomorrow. How many of you have something you want to do, but you put it off? Go back to school, switch jobs, leave him or her, lose weight, travel, write a book, take a class, watch less TV, get off Facebook, find a way to be happier. Resistance in a nutshell is fear of failure, it's procrastination, and it's self-doubt. And the good news and the bad news is we are all its victims, but in our lives and in the workplace, this can be a really bad thing. So for me, this book was about whatever you are resisting the most, that thing that's pecking at the back of your head when you're alone in your car driving down the road, that's the thing you're probably supposed to do. And for me, it was write more, which was ridiculous. I couldn't write more, I was a TV journalist, all I did was write. But after reading this book, I began a blog on my own website. 
I wrote essays that garnered thousands of followers. I wrote a book and a half. Yes, I have. I'm not saying I conquered resistance. But I did it. There's an area in neuroscience that proves this whole thing about us being creatures of habit. How we fear the unknown. That our brains really like certainty. Dr. David Roth, the author of the Handbook of Neuroleadership, explains that uncertainty registers in the brain as an error, gap, or tension. And that it's something that's got to be corrected so we can feel okay again. That's why people crave certainty. Not knowing what will happen can be profoundly debilitating because it requires extra neural energy. This can hurt our memories, hurt our performance, and takes us out of the present. So is anyone you've ever loved been seriously sick? You didn't know if they were gonna be okay. Maybe it was you who was sick or had a health scare, or lost a job, or had your heart broken, or were stabbed in the back by someone you trusted. That is uncertainty. Changes at work, well, they're among the top life stressors. When there are big changes, we are suddenly thrown into a state of uncertainty. It's funny to see myself on the set again. In the almost 25 years I was in TV news, the industry changed dramatically. Co-workers were offered buyouts, our staff shrank. Reporters had to begin shooting their own video. Everyone got pay cuts. Oh, and let's not forget the public started hating us even more than usual. So we were doing more, earning less, and losing an audience. The greatest threat to local news is this. About a decade ago, we began freaking out, trying to figure out how to compete with news available in the palm of your hand at any hour of the day. Appointment television started to go away. No more 5, 6 o'clock news, 11 o'clock news. <coughs> so we twisted ourselves in knots. We all had to work harder. We had to write for the TV and web. We had Facebook, Tweet, and Instagram, and do public events. And the bad news for TV news is that the audience is still shrinking today. You hear about people cutting the cord? When they cut the cord, they're often cutting the cord on local news. But it doesn't matter what your industry is. We've all had to go through change. And we all have universal concerns, like if our boss likes us. I've had bosses not like me. Has anyone in here ever had a boss not like them? Is some reorganization going to hurt us? Are we too old that we feel invisible? Or are we too young to be taken seriously? I mean, why do we have to have bean bags and ping pong tables for millennials, mm -hmm. right? Nobody ever did anything for me. And don't even get us started when we have a new boss. People are like, oh my God, I'm gonna have to prove myself all over again. I'm too old for this. Well, the bottom line is it's perfectly normal to feel fear about change in our jobs or industries. But where we get into trouble is how we respond to it. Fighting change, being negative, not going along with it. The mask, I love writing about this. I've written about it a lot, but we all wear them. And I don't care if you're a CEO or you work in the paint section at Home Depot. We put our mask in place when we are out in the world and we are out at our jobs and it's how we do adulting. And most of us are so adept at this, we don't even realize that we're doing it. But then there will be that new story. That seemingly normal California couple who held their dozen kids captive and starved them. Well, that's a dramatic example of a mask. But then think about what you're like at work, you know, versus what you're like at home. <laughs> I'm different. I mean, I am. I'm one way at work and one way at home. And I speak differently to my husband and kids because I know I can't yell at my coworker for ignoring the low toner button, leaving it to me. But I can yell at my 13-year-old son who won't stop playing Fortnite in the basement. <laughs> no problem yelling at him. So what happens if you take your mask off at work? We've seen them. There are the people who say things at meetings that we would never say. You're like, oh. oh. And sadly, most of what they're saying is negative. So here's a way to handle change at work while letting the mask slip just a little bit so you can breathe better. Acknowledge the change. Whether it's quietly in your head or coworkers, just acknowledge it, because a lot of us don't. A lot of us start creating a narrative where we're fighting it from day one. So just acknowledge it. Pull your weight. Times of change almost always demand more of us. Make sure you're doing your job and what's necessary to make the change successful, regardless of how you feel about it. And to be brutally honest, this is where you need to remember, this is why you get a paycheck, to carry out duties. Take stock. Now this is where you have the luxury to ask yourself how you feel about it, if you're okay with it, what it means for you, if you fear for your job or you want to switch jobs, what impact will it have on you and your staff going forward and for the company as a whole? 
do a worst case scenario play out. I love this. You think about what is the worst thing that can happen with the system update or the company overhaul. Write it down or talk it out. Go as dark and as negative and as bleak as you want. Just get it all out and then let it go because there's nothing you can do about it. And as my grandma always said, worry is like a rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but it doesn't get you anywhere. <laughs> Be vulnerable. This is hard, but important. You have to share your worries with someone you can trust. So whether it's your spouse, <coughs> coworker, friend, sibling, parent, or kid, it's productive and cathartic to speak our truth and fears to someone. It takes some of that fear away. Just make sure you don't tell someone who's gonna to listen to you and wind up making you feel worse and say, yeah, sounds like you're really screwed, yeah. <laughs> right? You need to choose wisely in who you talk to. This is, I swear, in my mind, the most important. Don't listen to your inner soundtrack. This is that time when the voice in our heads like goes into overdrive, telling you you can't do it. You don't have the right people. It's not the right plan. It's a disaster waiting to happen, and you're going to be blamed for it. Or worse yet, it will go well, and your boss will take all the credit, and you're going to be left behind because you're too old, or you're going to be left behind because you're too young. Just remember that the majority of these thoughts that our brains have all day long are negative, and they are only thoughts, which means they are not true. We forget that. We believe the thoughts in our head. Don't make it about you. I was very good at this. If my boss and my husband was the same way, we were both in the news business together, did not say hi to me in the appropriate <coughs> way or give me enough of a smile, I'd be like, oh my God, what did I do? <laughs> oh my God, am I trouble? What did I forget? What did I do? And I would fret, he would fret. And the truth is is, 95% of the time, they are not thinking about you. They are thinking about themselves, just as you were thinking about yourself. Do a self-evaluation. Try to get outside and see yourself objectively. This is hard and painful, but if you're bold enough, ask someone that you really admire and trust for feedback, and then you've got to be prepared for the honesty. And then beyond that, try to use that feedback to make some necessary changes. Has anyone here heard of the Dunning-Kruger effect? Oh my gosh, I love this thing. I'm putting it in my new TV show. Because, okay, so let me explain it to you guys. In 1999, mm -hmm. there were these two Cornell psychologists, Dunning and Kruger, and basically this is what they discovered. They discovered that people who are incompetent at something are unable to recognize their own incompetence. And not only do they fail to recognize their own incompetence, they're also likely to feel confident that they are actually competent. We have all worked with people like this. I have worked with a lot of people like this. And that little asterisk is mine, because to me that's the definition of ignorance is bliss. Now we can find the Dunning and Kruger effect everywhere. One study of high-tech firms discovered 32 to 42 percent of software engineers rated their skills as being in the top five percent of their companies. That's mathematically impossible. A nationwide survey found 21 percent of Americans are pretty confident they'll be millionaires in the next decade. Drivers always rate themselves as really high. And in a study of faculty at the University of Nebraska, 90 percent rated themselves above average. So this is where leadership and mentoring is everything. Professor Dunning said, many employees don't know they're underperforming because they don't know what they could be doing better or what a really great performance looks like. It's not that they're being defensive, it's that they actually just lack knowledge. And those people were willing to criticize their poor skills once they were trained up and they could see the difference, like, oh yeah, I've improved now. So it is the job of us in the workforce to give those around us perspective and a chance to do it, especially in the midst of upheaval or change. In one study, more than 30,000 employees answered dozens of workplace questions, including I know whether my performance is where it should be. Frighteningly, only 29% said they always know. 36% say they never or rarely knew. <clears throat> so it's up to leadership in this room to communicate and guide your employees to tell them where they are achieving and where they aren't so that when change comes, you're both better equipped to handle it. One of the great things about being a kid, in my mind, is that you had people to parent you, and I would argue that we need that throughout our entire lives. It shows that someone is invested in and really cares about us, so you need to parent your people and yourself through a change. You have to reinforce for them the good that will come out of it. A parent would do that. You have to give them a timeline of how long the change will take, and I swear it helps. Even if the change is 27 months of hell, you just at least you can brace for it. <coughs> You have to reassure people of what will stay the same 
and you have to be honest with them about what's going to change. And what are we doing here? We are removing uncertainty, because that is the thing that could lose you good people who feel adrift and scared during times of change. Even if the certainty is that this is going to be really terrible for a while, that level of honesty with your colleagues will go a million miles. You know, there are people for whom work is the center of their life. We've known them, workaholics, it defines them, it is who they are. Then there are people for whom work is what pays the mortgage and gets the kids to college. Fridays are the best days, Sunday nights are the worst. And then there's the rest of us who are somewhere between those two spectrums. But I firmly believe that when there's change at work and even when there isn't change at work, what you do in your life outside your job will really impact how you handle stress inside your job. So here's grandma's recipe, tried and true. You gotta take care of yourself physically. You have to exercise and eat well and get seven hours of sleep a night. I'm now at the Brain Health Center. I can tell you that research shows less than seven hours you're impaired to some degree, unless you're like in the 5% who doesn't need a lot of sleep. Don't self-medicate or numb yourself with alcohol or drugs. And if you're a person of faith, pray every morning, you know, before the whole house wakes up or after they go to bed or in the car instead of talking on the phone for five minutes. Or if you're not religious, meditate. Be mindful. Just take deep breaths and try to relax your mind. Don't hold it in. Be vulnerable. Share. I'm going to say exercise again because it is an incredible stress reliever. And watch the alcohol. You can't drink your way out of the stress of change, although I think a lot of us in this room have probably tried. Alcohol is a depressant. It will ultimately make you feel worse. Remind yourself of the important and valuable things in your life outside of here. And one way to do this is to be horribly fatalistic like me and kill yourself off. Or to say, if I knew if I was going to die tomorrow, what would I care about? Not what would I do, because what would I do means we'd all be quitting our jobs. Mm -hmm. But what would I care about? Well, love, right? Love. The people I've loved and the people who've loved me back. But here's the truth. And you can take this as a positive or negative. I think it's a positive. We all have limited time, and we are all terminal. So what would you do? Would you see the people you love more? The people you've been meaning to call up? Would you go for a walk or have coffee with someone or dinner? Would you travel more? Would you wish you had helped people more? And this brings us back to resistance because right now maybe in your brains while you're thinking that, we have a long list of the things that we would do and be if only there were more time, right? If we weren't afraid of failure. If we had more money, opportunities, connections, etc. Those are all excuses. I'm sorry to say you do have time. I have four kids, but I managed to write a book and a half and a blog and a full-time job. There was a reporter I worked with a million years ago in Connecticut named Dan Kane. I loved him, and yes, he looks like Ted Turner. And his claim to fame was that he was the news anchor on the Playboy channel when the Playboy channel was on TV. And then he moved to local news and was a hilarious feature reporter. He worked his tail off outside of TV, and he was always getting another advanced degree, and married and raising kids. And here I was, a 28-year-old woman who was feeling completely overwhelmed by my life, and we were at a party together outside of work, and I commented to him that I didn't know how he did it all. And this is, was his answer. Kid, the more you do, the more you can do. I will never forget it, but I did not get it at the time. I thought I was busy when I was single and working. Then I got married and I became a stepmother to two little girls, busier. Then I had two of my own children, busier. Add in a dog, don't forget the job, hurricanes, trials, car crashes, Olympics, September 11th, city council meetings, piling on, piling on, piling on. But Dan Kane was right, the more you do, the more you can do. And yes, we all have a breaking point and I've hit mine several times before and it does not feel like being overextended, it feels like crashing head on into a concrete barrier. I also don't wanna downplay the importance of perspective when dealing with change or stress at work. In the white dress is Mary Elizabeth Paris, the other girl is Laura Stewart, and at the bottom is Leah Lucier. I knew these kids, I loved these kids, I told their stories, they all had cancer and they all died. Mary Elizabeth died at 13, and Laura and Leo died at 19. I spoke at Leo's funeral. And we talked about a lot of things. And all they wanted was to be able to grow up to deal with this beautiful messiness of being a human being. All they wanted was to live. Same for their parents. And they didn't get it. I truly do think of them when I'm in a pity party to remind myself that despite 
all the craziness, this life is such a beautiful gift that the coworker who steals everyone's lunches from the fridge in the break room is not all bad. And that the talk we had with a colleague about their sick husband or wife or kid is something that drew us closer together. Which brings me to my last point. This bugger is a problem. It's given us incredible connectivity, yet we are more disconnected from each other than ever before. I have watched lifelong friendships and on Facebook over political fights. In elevators, we are all on our phones instead of awkwardly staring at walls, not looking at each other. <laughs> right? In the street, we're face down in the phone. In our meetings with each other, with our coworkers before they start, we're all face down in the phone. As someone who is herself addicted, hi, my name is Jay, I have a problem. I'd like to remind you of something very powerful and important that I heard said by a thought leader named Simon Sinek. This thing will never, ever love you back. We are wired for human connection. Not just in our private lives, but in our lives. A lot of us spend more time with our coworkers than we spend with our families. In this room right now, this is probably the only time that we will ever be together. And you may walk away from this thinking, well, that was weird, or that was interesting, or I feel sorry for her husband. <laughs> Human connection is what gets us through absolutely every single thing that is going to come at us in life. We live in a world swirling in uncertainty and we waste so much energy fighting and flailing, trying to wrest control of the universe back to ourselves. If only we could surrender and accept that there are very few things we can control, including how our lives will turn out. None of us in this room knows the ending to our own stories. None of us. And the happiest people I've ever met, and yes, I have met the Dalai Lama, they haven't learned how to control life, since that's an impossibility. They adapt to change, and they control how they react to it. I can tell you that giving into the things I've resisted the most have changed my life for the better. A philanthropist who liked my reporting created a job for me at Emory to tell stories about the brain and mind. And I said no for two years. I had no reason to take that job. I had a good gig, editorial control. I was loved by my corporation. Why would I go and leave and do something that hadn't been done? In a world of scientists in a language I didn't know, all alone without another journalist with me, well, then there's the other part of your brain that says, well, I had done the other thing so long. I had learned about all there was to learn. I was now in the days where I was teaching other journalists. This new thing was using my skills in a different way, and it was a way that could possibly really help people. So after two years, I said yes, and then I regretted it horribly, freaked out, lost my mind. It didn't help that the bosses and TV fought to keep me, but I was a wreck. I was leaving TV, who would air my stories? I had no clue how stupid was I. Could, I couldn't believe I had ruined my life like this. And that is the voice in your head. 20 months ago, I moved to Emory. 11 months later, PBS in Georgia offered me my own TV show for these stories on the brain and mind. It premieres in three months. It will be on across the entire state, Alabama, Mississippi, Florida, mail <coughs> premiere. And we are hoping to take it national within the first two years. And ultimately, what I have learned about myself, this woman who hates change, is that I'm most comfortable being uncomfortable because that's how I know I'm growing. And I have grown so much in the past 20 months, I should be 18 feet tall. The show, by the way, is called Your Fantastic Mind. Here's 25 seconds. <laughs> To your fantastic mind. I'm Jay Watson. This is a show where we explore the mysteries and the science of the amazing human brain. So, I never saw this happening. Maybe my mistake is that I didn't dream big enough for myself, and I think most of us are guilty of that. We try to control and box in our expectations for our life. People call me weekly, no joke, from around the country in journalism asking how they can do this for themselves make this happen for themselves when I'm doing it. I don't have an answer or a roadmap for them. And in some ways, I'm as clueless as anyone. And I would say, yeah, there's a bit of luck involved in this for sure. 
But part of it is that great thing about getting older. And unlike a lot of people, I am the biggest fan of getting older. Now that I've hurt my knee and the shoulder in the past year, that's not the good part about getting older. But you learn from your screw-ups. You stop feeling like a fraud. You realize you have value and it's not dependent upon what your boss thinks of you. You do a good job because it matters to you. In essence, you are becoming who you are meant to be. You are being called to your higher self. And dear sweet baby Jesus, even when another boot boss shows up or a system update happens, you roll with it because you've worked hard to get here. And the changes, while tough, will teach you more about who you are and will help you get to the next level of your life. And if you're lucky, at the end of the day, you come home to chaos and love, the world's most patient husband, and a lot of dog hair. I leave you with this thought that applies to work and life and everything in between from Amelia Earhart. The most difficult thing is the decision to act. The rest is merely tenacity. The fears are paper tigers. You can do anything you decide to do. Thank you.